and we are out here in the heart of Bishwick at 56 Bogart Street. We're gonna run into Nurture Art and listen to a presentation by Walter Robinson. Like five years ago, one of my dealers from Metro Pictures, Celine Longner, you know, came and got me and said, why don't we show the stuff from the 80s? And it turned out, you know, it all looked pretty good. And they <laughs> sold the hell out of it. I saw that show. And, and um, it, it was interesting to me because uh, besides all the attention I got and, and um, the money, you know, I was able to go and, and rent a studio, which I had been working in my front room all those, all those times. In my spare time, it was a Sunday thing. And there's nothing like money to encourage you. You know, it's a great <laughs> and she came and got it, and those pictures were pretty good. So anyway, um, you know, I don't know. I'm a painter, and and um, you like there's a painting of a cheeseburger there, and I forget. It's like a commercial. It's like a cheeseburger. It's like an Arby's or a Denny's. It's it's a cheeseburger they use in the ads, and and you know it's. Um, you know, I'm a painter with no imagination. I paint really plain things. The plain things and obvious things, and, and you know, but there's still things that I want. Uh, at the same time, there's a certain kind of warm feeling that people have when it comes to cheeseburgers. <laughs> people like cheeseburgers, and they can relate to it on a, some people can relate to it on a personal, personal level. So. I don't know, I was doing paintings of cheeseburgers. I brought some paintings. This one's called Big America. Yes. Um, and so I thought these, these two goofballs would run this gallery in this village called Dorian Bray Gallery. You know, good name, but it's kind of a blank slate. And they, one of the guys who runs it, and he's like, let's do a show. And I said, okay. And I thought, okay, so here's what we'll do. I had a brainstorm. We'll we'll take a full page ad in the in the beginning of in the front of our forum. It, it would cost eight thousand dollars, you know, to be in the first ten percent of the book. Full page color could say Walter Robinson, New Cheeseburgers, Dorian Gray Gallery. I thought that would be great. And we put them on the map, you know, like you're a player if you're taking a full page ad. And they said no. <laughs> he said no, that they didn't want to spend $8,000 on an ad in our forum. He said, uh, I spent enough money on this gallery already. And they, they, uh, they said they didn't have any. I said, well, do you sell stuff? They said, no, we don't. We don't have any clients. We don't usually sell anything. Said, well, that's interesting. Well, then what kind of price point do you want to go for? And they're like, you know. Low. <laughs> so, so you know, and and um, the place has a good name, right? And it it, it tests well. Let's say I go to people and I say, and they go, oh yeah, I've heard of Dorian Gray Gallery. Yeah, I've heard of that. But actually, you know, it doesn't really have a program that makes any sense. So for me, as a veteran of the East Village, that when 
that's exactly how you had shows back then, is that somebody running to you on the street and say, hey, do you want to have a show in my gallery? I said, let's do it in... March 1st. March, when Armory shows here. Like that might make a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm a big planner. Sure. And, um, I don't know, this isn't a very funny story, but... That, so I had two months, so I knocked out all the paintings. I went to the, I went to the art supply store and bought a bunch of um, cheap canvases, and I, did, I thought, well, if they're going to be cheap, I should do them as fast and as cheap as I can. I did a whole bunch of works on paper. I gave them 55 works, and the cheapest ones were $1,200, and the most expensive one was, I don't know, $2,500. And in the end, of course, it didn't matter because I got them all back <laughs> for the ones on paper. Go in thinking of it kind of as a lark and end up thinking that, oh my god, these are the best paintings I ever made. So this painting is actually a Amy's Veggie Burger, in case anybody eats veggies. You may recognize that I made it specifically for an art collector who, he's like, I'm a vegetarian man, I can't buy a painting of a cheeseburger. So I made him a veggie burger and he's like, oh, I eat those all the time. He didn't buy that either. <laughs> but, so, he's a guy who likes finely finished pictures. And you know, like, I try to paint in an illustrational style, um, uh, somewhere in between John Singer Sargent and Paint by Numbers. Because I'm trying to, you know, I, I hate the whole thing where you have to think of some kind of avant-garde way to make art. I just can't stand it. And so, for me then, the question is really, does it look good or not? And sometimes they, they get more photorealistic and other times they're more gestural. And, so no new cheeseburgers, no ad in Art Forum. And, so the, one of the other guy who runs the gallery, who's kind of a salesman guy, says, let's call it indulgences. I like that. We can call it indulgences. He wants all the still lifes. Cause I have a lot of erotica in the studio, which you know people like, but nobody buys erotica, at least unless they're erotica collectors. So he says, let's do indulgences. And I'm thinking, God, that sounds stupid. Indulgence is a sin that you're allowed to commit, or that you're forgiven for committing. And, and all these things that I'm going to paint are sins that, shall we say, the big companies or the society of the spectacle or whatever you want to say, give us permission to, to, to eat. And so, so that sort of gave the concept like enough dimension for me to get behind it. And so I painted a bunch of indulgences and these are Aunt Jemima pancakes and it's the picture off the front of the box. There's a hot dog, sort of going to heaven. <laughs> There's some seven layer cake. These are, um, this is uh, cornbread. Do you paint from photographs or from the actual food? I paint from photographs of the front of the boxes the food comes in. Here's a pile of money, it's from a bank. It's like, uh, <laughs> No, no, I thought it was funny to do it in Grisaille, which is kind of what the neoclassical era did to refer back to the classical times. So I thought it would be kind of funny to do money as an art antique. These are my daily medications. People like paintings of pill bottles, you know. Um, there's painkillers. People like painkillers that. I had a big show of paintings like this at Metro Pictures in 1986, and the, you know, it's already designed, right? I don't have to become a person who refines his taste so that making something tasteful that will appeal to people, because it's already been designed to appeal to people. And I guess my, my um, uh, what's it called, your trademark? Signature. Yeah, my uh, brand. Yeah, my brand. <laughs> my brand are these romance pictures off the front of paperback books. So I did a bunch of romances because that's what people like, you know. That is to say, that is to say, I had a studio sale in last fall or oh, Christmas. It was around Christmas, and the things that people bought were mostly romance, romances. 
kissing, you know? So I threw in some people kissing paintings. That was a really pretty one. This one's from a Harlequin romance with a little boat. I like to leave it dirty. This one has got a Cezanne landscape in it. Paintings. There's one of the paintings, the painting I sold out of Poncho Denison. That's from a paperback book cover. Andy Hall bought it. There's a nurse painting. Like, I thought Richard should buy this one. So I made some paintings of Julian Schnabel's girlfriends. This is Olaz. <laughs> this is Rula. Olaz, he married. This is May Anderson, his new girlfriend, who's having a baby. She's a uh, sort of playboy. She was a playboy cover of mom. Mm -hmm. I did a group of paintings that are based on the clothing, clothing ads from Macy's. And um, these girls are selling dresses. And I, I just sort of, I forget the name of them. It's like, it's called High Heeled Sandals and Shifts or something. I just thought it's funny as a figure of painting and like how empty it could be, but at the same time how full, because they're selling. So the painting is a commodity and it's announcing in a way it's commodity-ness, like, like the ads do, I guess. But we ignore them, we ignore them all the time, so I'm, I'm saving them in a, as a painting and I like the figures because they're already designed to be beautiful and they're smiling at you. They're, they're, they're selling, you know, and I like that. And they're figure paintings. And I think of like, who makes figure paintings where the subjects are smiling at you? Nobody. So I thought, that's good. So these girls, these three graces are in pajamas and these guys are selling jeans. Try to put some guys in. And there's a big one, they're selling pajamas also. I like it when they're selling pajamas. Seems kind of, you know, seems kind of funny. I have one, I have this really great one of, uh, you know, I'm like Richard Prince, right? He would see cowboy ads for Marlboro's and think, oh, there's a new one. I had a bunch of people come to my studio and different people will tell you different things. It's fascinating. You know, some people will tell you, you will confuse everybody. Just have one kind of thing, put everything else behind the curtain. One thing, you'll confuse them. Remember um, Barnett Newman, he would have a chair in one painting, and that's all you can see. Or uh, Neil Jenny, a famous story about Neil that he makes Holly Solomon wait in the lob in the hallway and he drags out one painting and says, This is it. Do you, you want it or not? So, <laughs> and I wish we could like, do that. So, okay, so I, so I had that. These guys come and they immediately go to the back and start pouring through everything because they want to see everything. I like that, right? To me, I like it better if it's the place is full of crap because that just suits me better. I like to see all the different stuff and be able to pick. I couldn't figure out how to make an abstract painting and then I probably got the idea from my then wife to you to make spin paintings instead. And you don't have to. You don't have to like take responsibility for it because it's common. Everybody's already got it. So, but so I had these spin paintings for 25 years. How many years is it since 1986? And, and so I lent them to them, but I said that the insurance value was $25,000 a piece. That they're $25,000 a piece now because. Back in the 80s, I gave them away, I traded them, I gave away so much artwork. But now I don't wanna, I don't wanna give them away and I only wanna sell them for a lot of money, so it means I still have them all. And, and um, two of them were fucked up by the flood. They were like warped like this. And Paul Judelson and his team, they got me a, an insurance settlement of $25,000 and I got the paintings back. There's a lot of reasons to use images that are already public. I mean, there's, there's something about it, the fact that it's already there. I used to argue that it's a fact. I'm just reporting a fact. You can't copyright facts. But, you know, the, some of the some of the best pulp paperback cover artists mm -hmm. like Robert McGinnis, they're still alive, you know. Mm -hmm. 
sure they would be very upset. So it started out as a as a kind of homage and just as sort of like kind of a hobbyist sort of thing back in the eighties. It's like should I paint? You know, I'd really like to be able to paint like that. I mean, copy some of those colors. Everybody loved it. You know, so back then it seemed more like a preservationist kind of thing, which it's not anymore. You know, the, on Flickr, there's if you look for a pulp paperback, there's a what an archive of pictures tagged pulp paperback. There's twenty five thousand images. The thing is, I have a really broad taste as a critic. You know, uh, maybe I identify that I used to joke that that uh, you know an artist works what six months for a show, uh, their whole life for a show. Art, okay, so an artist works six months, a dealer works for two weeks, a critic comes in, looks around for two minutes, and says it's crap. You know, it's like really different ways of looking at the world. And, um, as a critic, I always try to be more open-minded and, and um, you know, have more amused stance and try to give more credit to the artist. You know, a lot of people say that criticism is only interesting insofar as the, as the critic has an opinion. And to me, that's like the least interesting thing because everybody has opinions. You know what I'm saying? Like assholes. Or and, and they all stink. <laughs> so, you know, I always, I always say that because, you know, as a critic, it's my opinion that counts anyway, not all these other people's. From the very beginning, you know, it's like I have a job, I have my art, and I need some other project to keep me amused. So, you know, you have different projects, I guess. I don't know. Don't ask me. Uh, this kind of bounces off of uh, Karen's question. Um, you got together and started a little magazine called Art Right, I guess back in the mid, late 70s. And then you were also uh, one of the first people that got involved in uh, putting art online with uh, Artnet. And so my question is, where do you think the, uh, the whole uh, intersection between art, criticism, and the internet is going these days? Well, you know, I'm ready for that because I was on a panel at the College Art Association. You've been ready for that for 15 years. And, and it was really cool because um, this guy, Barry Schwabsky, writes for The Nation. He, like, starts out, he says, I don't think social media has anything to contribute to art criticism. So you got to admit, you know, he's kind of right in the sense that, that, that art criticism is long, thought-out, researched pieces. But I answered that, that, you know, there's something to be said for a punchy 120, it's 120 characters. Something to be said for a tweet, but uh, for me, my life is all about mobile now. I'm all on the phone. So that's changed the complexion of my behavior completely. Plus, I get art forum for free in the mail, and it sits there like homework that I'm not doing. <laughs> and, but there are so many articles in that magazine, and, and in a way I feel like there's a lot of ideas there, and they're fun to read and stuff. And it's fun to know about them, but it seems to me in this business you can go through your whole life and nobody, not one person, will come up to you and say, hey, did you read that article in Art Forum? Or, you know, in, in my case, when, when I, when I was in the business of uh, you know, people, I got paid to read art criticism, right? That was my job, I got paid to read it. And we'd post several stories every day, and I'd keep meeting people, and I'd say, you mean you didn't read that article I wrote? No, and like, no, they hadn't. So, I don't know, uh, uh, now, like, on mobile, like, what's really transformed is the information business. You know, so you, I find out everything by looking at people I follow on Twitter, and then I get these emails from Art Info and Gallerist, and also from Art Agenda, you know, those people, and um, occasionally I'll scan an article uh, on my uh, cell phone, but most of this stuff I don't think is real art criticism in the sense that um, 
say, reading the catalog for the Impressionism show is? The thing about a question like that is that art criticism isn't monolithic now, it never was monolithic. Uh, so to talk about it as if it were one thing is a little confusing, you know? Uh, there, the people who contribute to art forum, there's this, are so smart and they are, they write these long, detailed, articulated, academic articles, it's a whole other world than the sort of daily world of gossip and chat that we live our lives in. But for those guys, it's a whole world they live in, I think. You know what? I, I, I'm, I think. The show at Metro Pictures in 2008 worked really good, you know. They have clients. I don't really know who they are. I mean, I, may, I meet art collectors and um, it kind of made my skin crawl. That's what that's what art dealers are for. You know? Is the art space on my Oh, the, don't start me getting put on art space. <laughs> and you know, at at uh, I tell everybody this, so I'm supposed to tell you. I walked away from the from the art spit, from the Metro Picture Show with ninety five thousand dollars. That was my half. I was very. I thought like this is real. That's what I'm living on now. That's what retirement is. That's the money you have. Parting words of advice from your years of career. People want advice. <laughs> 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 the advice. I would say stop fucking around and be <laughs> successful. <laughs> no. <laughs> Enough with the like wrestling. Just you know, go out there and be a star. <laughs> Seriously, that's what like, I was thinking. Why the fuck am I working so hard? Why not just be so I don't know. Thanks, Walter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>